come all the way from Fort Benning, Georgia, from Columbus, Georgia, to speak to us. Not only that, but she came in spite of Hurricane <laughs> Michael bearing down on her home, hitting it at Category 1 ferocity. Uh, so we are, I mean, even just showing up here is <laughs> tremendous courage. Uh, Dr. Opal, Major Opal, she has so many letters at the end of her name. Uh, That's alphabet. Was born in California, got her Bachelor of Science in Animal Science from the University of California, Davis, got her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from Washington State University, then entered the Army uh, and has been there in the Army now for 10 years, is now a major, uh, and she is a co-founder, really, of the program that she will be talking to us about today. She has seen service at several uh, Army bases, uh, and including Puerto Rico. Uh, she uh, came here for her master's degree of public health, something that veterinarians don't ordinarily do. So she has yet more initials at the end of her name. And in particular, she specialized in, again, the program that she helped to inaugurate and that, frankly, Tennessee, University of Tennessee, helped the Army to initiate. Uh, so uh, let me just say once again how grateful we are that she could come and would come in spite of all these obstacles. And we have now Major Dr. Taylor Opal speaking to us on healing wounds, how animals can help our soldiers. I was 
was able to come back and get my master's uh, here at UT. And now I'm down at Fort Benning doing our first year graduate veterinary education program, which is a lot of words. We cut it down to Figby. And what that program does is teach, I am one of the instructors that teaches our new veterinary officers how to be an officer in the military. They come out of vet school, they know how to be a doctor, but they don't know how to do the public health mission and they don't know how to lead soldiers. So that's what we do with them down there. It's a really fun job because I get to hang out with all of my, all of the new exciting um, uh, officers coming up. So that's where I am at Fort Benning. Um, while I was here, I did work with the Habit program, the Human Animal Bond in Tennessee program, which is one of the largest human animal bond programs in the country. It's really strong. Uh, I just learned that they've expanded out to Chattanooga and now they're in Nashville, so it's really exciting. And I worked with them to um, uh, update their evaluation, uh, behavioral evaluation program to get the right animals and the right dogs in to, uh, to be serviced. Uh, the human animal bond in the veterinary corps is very new. They only, um, so the army uh, paid for me to go back to school and they only started funding those scholarships a couple years ago specifically for the human animal bond emphasis. And so uh, Colonel Anderson and Colonel Chumley really championed that to make it happen. And then uh, we have Majors French, Crawford and Olson who graduated from here in 2015 and then I graduated in 2017. So there's really only four of us veterinary officers in the entire army that are focusing on human animal bond. So it's, it's in its baby stages right now. And please, if anybody has any questions, feel, feel free, free to you know, holler at me and, and let me know. So. so a little bit about human animal bond programs and kind of the support behind these in implementing them in our you know, hospitals and our nursing homes and other and so we have some evidence, there is some studies out there that they help physically, socially, and with our mental health of, of people. And it's kind of, yeah, everybody kind of intuitively knows that this is the case. If you like animals, if you don't like animals, they can't help you there. Um, but we kind of intuitively know this, but we need to have the data to back it up. And that's something that is a, a little bit of a struggle with, the, uh, with this science now. And so there have been some studies that show that they do help with physiologic parameters, and that's what we're really looking for is, are they helping you know, decrease blood pressure? Are they helping decrease stress and anxiety? Are they helping decrease cortisol levels? And so looking at these really strong, solid facts is what um, we need to support these programs. And a lot of um, what we're looking at is, um, in, uh, in hospitals, in nursing homes, to, to get those animals in there, in schools as well. We have programs uh, in grammar schools with reading programs. Is that something that is, is good to add on when you're working with children who have reading disabilities or trouble, or just, just to be motivational for the kids to read? So it kind of um, is, is all across the spectrum. So a couple studies, uh, social catalysts. And this is a big benefit when you're talking about soldiers that are dealing with mental health issues. So if you have soldiers dealing with anxiety and depression and PTSD, a lot of them become, um, you know, they draw in, they don't go out, they don't have social connections, they don't have interactions that they normally had. And so the, these studies have shown that simply having a dog with you, people will come up to you and they will talk to you. They feel more comfortable interacting with you it kind of bridges that, that gap in social interaction, encourages uh, people to come and, and interact with you. It also encourages the person. If you have a dog, you have to go and walk that dog. You have to go out and get into society with your dog to get them food and water and oh, they gotta go to the bathroom so I gotta take them on a walk. So it increases the motivation for that person to get out of the house. And sometimes it's really, really hard with some of our our soldiers dealing with mental health issues to just simply walk out the door. They, they don't even want to walk out the door. And so that's what we're, we're looking at is getting these dogs so that it encourages that social interaction. And so the mental health benefits, we all, we all kind of know um, if you like dogs, then 
you know, being around them, being around animals in general, has just shown to be very calming on people. And so we're looking into how these effects um, reduce stress, anxiety, depression, and increase independence. Yes? Are these dogs assigned to a soldier, or are they checked out like you do at the library? Or you... <laughs> we'll get into those. There's a couple different pro there's a couple different ways that these programs work. So yes and no, <laughs> depending upon the program and depending upon what um, uh, what the intent is of that program. Yes. Do the dogs get any special training before they're assigned, or where are they go? Same, 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 same kind of question. So yeah, I'll, I'll address that. <clears throat> have there been studies done for soldiers that are in a combat zone that happen to have a dog? Like a working dog? Yes. And, and yes. Does it, do all these things apply in a combat zone for those soldiers? It does. And they, there was one pilot program about, I want to say, three or four years ago where they did have um, official, how they called them, like, I can't remember. I can't remember what the, what the official name of that program was, but they had three dogs that went into deployed environments and were basically what we call animal-assisted um, activity dogs. So they went there, they were a couple Labradors, they were just basically there for de-stress and they were there for, uh, you know, for, you know, just so that soldiers could have a dog to cuddle with, you know, when they were very stressed out. And that program was incredibly successful. Everybody liked it. The commanders liked it. The uh, the soldiers liked it. And then the army said, "No, we can't fund it," and so it went away. <laughs> so unfortunately, that's one of our biggest issues: is getting funding for these and getting solid research behind these programs supports getting funding for them. So yes, and units that have a working dog, a strict military working dog, they have um, you know higher stress level reduction just because they have that dog with them and they're able to interact with that dog. So even not even just having a you know a you know goofy Labrador hanging out with you, but having a working dog there really does help the units. And sometimes the working dogs they'll they are basically living with the soldiers in a deployed setting and so they they kind of become impromptu mascots. That's I could ask a follow on question. Mm -hmm. um, are there some branches of the military that have embraced this more than others, and what comes to mind, I don't know if it's a good example, but SEAL Team 6, when they went on the range mm -hmm. with the Ben Laden, had a dog with them. Yes, that was a working dog. So are there some branches that embrace this more? In other words, do they have the vision that you have in the Navy for SEAL Team, or for the Marines, or some other? And I'll, I'll get a little bit into that when we get our working dog section, but all of the branches of the military have working dogs. And so that part of it is well established since, um, you know, World War One basically is when they started really recruiting and training up dogs for a job. Um, and with the kind of with the, the anxiety and stress reduction with yeah. therapy dogs, that is is coming from the army side because the army has the veterinarians. But we're at all military posts, so there's our there's the army. Veterinarians are at Air Force bases, Navy, and Marines. And so it's coming from the Army side. But as you'll see, one of our biggest programs is at Tripler in uh, Hawaii, and that's an Air Force base. So it's it's across all services. Mm -hmm. So one of our biggest, this is, this is our biggest problem, is getting good research. And so a uh, meta-analysis study came out, and they tried to look for those studies with some, at least, decent um, strength and so this was their these are the criteria and five participants that's not a lot, a lot but that's what we get it's a very small number and there's very few that have even control groups and so that's kind of what we're struggling with there's been a lot of research that just simply hasn't been very good and so now uh, UT is doing a fantastic job Here we go. Um, uh, the veterinary school has a lot of good studies coming out now that have control groups, they have really solid data, they have enough of a uh, participant pool to get some statistically significant results. And so out of these 250 abstracts, only 37 even met these very loose criteria. Um, 
and only half of those 37 had a control group, and then the results are kind of all over the place. So we see ones that are very supportive of these programs, and then we see ones that even that didn't show an effect or you know where it showed a negative effect. And the problem is is that what what situation are you looking at? So are you dealing with children versus adults? Are you dealing with seniors? Are you dealing with um, you know military? Are you dealing with dogs, cats, horses? If you have a situation where somebody is afraid of dogs or somebody just doesn't like dogs, that's not gonna work for that person. So these programs can be really variable in how they <coughs> affect your population and individual people. So um, it's, we can't really say that, oh great, if you put a dog program in your hospital, everybody's gonna love it and everybody's gonna be happy and everybody's gonna you know, think this is wonderful. So we have to look at um, kind of the variations that we see within these studies and what, what your intent is for these programs too. So the Warrior Canine Connection is a really strong human animal bond program at Walter Reed Medical Center. And this program has been around for, I want to say 10 plus years now. It is a civilian nonprofit organization that has worked with and has a, is in cooperation with the military community. This is one of the ways that we find the best to get human animal bond programs into military facilities is cooperating with a civilian established program because then there's some consistency. In the military, we move around a lot. So if you have somebody, usually it's a veterinarian, if you have somebody who's really excited about this, you know, does all the work to put this, the, this program into place at their hospital, and then they move, and the person replacing them is like, meh, I'm not really into that. That's where we, that's where we lose them. And so that's where, we, that's where these kind of programs kind of peter out. So what we're trying to do is establish a relationship with an outside civilian organization that can come in and we can work in cooperation with them. The Warrior Canine Connection is a really fantastic model. They have this mission-based trauma recovery model. And so it's really three separate, separate kind of stages. The first stage is where they have soldiers dealing with mental health issues and they are training up the puppies. They're doing the, they're doing the specific training on these puppies so that they can become service dogs for physically disabled soldiers. So the first stage is you get mental health, um, uh, soldiers with mental health problems. And in having this job, and a, a, biggest, a big issue with soldiers <coughs> in de dealing with mental health issues is that they lose their sense of purpose they don't really, they've been in the military, this is their life, they have a real strong identity, and then all of a sudden they don't, and they really feel kind of lost and kind of floating out there. And so this program gives them a sense of purpose and gives them that service uh, that they desire to do for their team. And they, so being able to train these dogs for another service member is really meaningful. And so that can help with their, with their recovery from PTSD or depression or anxiety. So that's kind of the first part. The middle part is when you're doing puppy raising and when you're doing training, they are out in Walter Reed, and this is kind of the animal assisted activity part of it, where these dogs are just out there interacting with the patients. And so they're learning, but they're also helping de-stress, you know, people who are in there for long treatments, long recovery times, families, children, and so then they get to see this you know, Labrador or this golden retriever running around the hospital and be able to, you know, have a little have a little time with those animals. And then when you get these dogs trained up, they're paired up with one of the uh, physically disabled service members. And so this is where we get into specific training. These dogs are going to be service dogs. And so they are trained for specific tasks, whether it's, you know, seeing eye dogs, hearing dogs, uh, seizure alert dogs. They also are trained for tasks opening doors, uh, retrieving things like, you know, go get my keys, go get my cell phone, whatever that individual uh, needs. So this is where you get into that specialized training for the dogs. Yeah? What percentage of the dogs make it through training? Oh. I do not have that number. Um, it's tough. There's a big drop off. I can't tell you that. I can't give you a good percentage, but there is a significant <coughs> drop because 
the training's intense and the dogs need to be very consistent and they need to be basically what we call bomb proof so they can't be afraid of anything or nervous about anything. Um, some of these dogs, th they'll fail out for something as simple as they're afraid of sprinklers going off. And it's like, well, you can't have, if someone has a seeing eye, seeing eye dog and they're walking along and the sprinkler goes off, you can't have that dog panic and freak out. <laughs> so um, there's a high drop off. I can't give you an exact percentage though. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, so this is great because we do also have some really good studies happening right now, and they are uh, funded, con congressionally funded. Hopefully, they're going to be really, really strong studies that support this program to be, you know, spread to other military facilities. So some of the challenges. This is one of my interns, and she is now in the UK. So she, her headquarters is in Vicenza, Italy, so she had to go to Italy a couple weeks ago, and I was just like, don't even talk to me. Um, so she's, you know, going all over Europe right now. Um, but some of the challenges that we face in our military communities are, you know, we move a lot, and moving with pets, especially overseas, can be very stressful, it can be very expensive. There's a lot of paperwork that you gotta go through if you're going to Hawaii or Japan. There's a lot of work to get these animals, and so um, we have, a lot of stress that comes with that. We have a lot of shifting family dynamics. If one, you know, one spouse gets deployed, the other spouse is at home, and now they have to take care of the dog and the kids and you know, household um, uh, finances, and so that can be really stressful. Um, we also have a little bit of changing di uh, demographics now. We have a lot of dual military, so if you have, you know, both parents leaving, who's taking care of the kids? Who's taking that care of the animals? How are we dealing? that um, a lot more women are serving and we have a very young population and so we have a lot of very young families that we're trying to they're trying to do their best for their animals and so we try to help them with that as the veterinary corps making sure that their animals are healthy and that they're able to afford taking care of their pets as well so it's a little bit older study but it just kind of reinforces the fact that it does cause a lot of stress when people, you know, when servicemen have to leave their pets. We have a lot of uh, families that simply can't afford to take their animals overseas. It could be a couple thousand dollars to get our animals somewhere, wherever they are in, in the world. And so they're left with families or they have to rehome them. And this caused significant stress on our military families. And uh, just like in the civilian world, people are beginning to treat their, fam their pets as family members. And so they're having a really strong bond. And when you're faced with, I can't afford to take this pet overseas, that's really, really traumatic for, for the families. Right. Make sure I have my time, watching my time here. So a couple of definitions. There's animal-assisted interventions is this kind of umbrella. And the two flavors of that are animal-assisted therapy and animal-assisted education. Animal-assisted therapy is very goal-oriented therapy. So it can be physical therapy, it can be um, occupational therapy, sometimes it can be um, help with uh, counseling sessions if you're dealing with a psychologist or a, a, a mental health therapist. And so, but these are animals being used for specific tasks. Uh, I did work a little bit with the stroke center um, uh, at the hospital here, and they have a dog team where basically the dog comes in and the people throw the ball for the dog, and that's motivating. I'm, it's surprising when you tell somebody, well, just throw this ball. Okay, not very exciting, not very motivating. Throw this ball for this dog. Oh, cool, I'm throwing a ball for a dog. I'll do that all day. And so if you have a physical therapy need to, you know, work with your, you know, reestablish those uh, functions, uh, using a dog can be really motivating. Uh, Animal-assisted education is reading programs in schools. If you have children with some learning disabilities or focus, attention disabilities, it's amazing. When you bring an animal and say, okay, I want you to read this book to this dog, all of a sudden that child is, oh my God. I'm gonna read this book for this dog, and they are like laser focused. So if you have a problem with just getting the child to focus, it's 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 kind of incredible that you know just having the dog there all of a sudden, wow, I'm really interested in reading this book to this dog. Um, 
Animal assisted activities are meet and greets, and so that's what Habit does. These are the, you know, these are pet dogs. They don't really have a whole heck of a lot of training. They go out and they make people feel better. You'll see the dogs in the uh, library here during finals time, and so de stress. Um, we send these dogs out to um, just, I mean, the, the children's hospital has dogs that go out there, and this is just basically to make these people feel good and feel better and be a little bit less stressed than they were before. Service and assistance animals, these are the uh, seeing eye dogs. They're specific for a diagnosed medical condition, and they have very specific tasks that they've been trained to do. And these are the dogs that are covered under the American for Disabilities Act, is our service dogs. Um, active duty, have, they allow psychiatric service dogs now for active duty. Unfortunately, the VA is not yet. Um, and they made that decision a couple years ago simply because the research isn't there. So hopefully we'll get some research and then the VA will be on board with the psychiatric service dogs. And then these emotional support animals. <sighs> I love talking about emotional support animals. Um, but they, these are people's pets. They are not trained for anything, and they are not supported under the ADA. Um, and we'll get a little bit into that. So, so this is actually at the library here at UT, and this is a habit dog, and so this is our animal-assisted activity, dog going in, making people feel better. And then if you have a situation where you have a therapist who's working with a patient in a specific you know, with specific goals, that's going to be our animal assisted interaction or intervention. And then our service dog for our wounded warrior. So if it's a, a you know, physical disability dog or a other, other very specifically trained animal, that's going to be our service animal. And then reading programs is our education. Okay, does anybody scare spiders? <laughs> and then we have our emotional support. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we focus on HAB because everybody loves, these are good news stories. These are happy. Everybody loves to hear that we're using animals to help people. And so it gives us, you know, warm fuzzies to have animals in our, you know, in our environment. All right. So one of our um, really good programs that we have is at a Triple Army Medical Center in Hawaii. I keep trying to get them to send me there, but not, not, not successful so far. And so this is one of our biggest, longest running programs, and they work with the local Red Cross to um, cooperate and get a really strong group of dog teams and really good, good policies to uh, uh, make this program last. And I think that it's been successful because it's had that consistency and it's had that cooperation between the Red Cross and between the military. Um, so this influenced the Red Cross human animal bond policy because for a long time, Red Cross shelters were not allowing people's pets to, they weren't allowing pets to be evacuated into Red Cross shelters and now they are. And so this is one of the programs, this, this kind of started that process to get policies in place to let that happen. So it's very exciting, and they do visitations all throughout the hospital there. Uh, another couple programs, we've got one at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and then one at Fort Belvoir, also working with Red Cross um, in the community to make these programs really strong and really sustained. Another couple things that we have, we, we do have finally, uh, it took years to get the one up and running in Okinawa, but finally we do have human out bond. A visitation program in Okinawa, but we also do a lot of different other just community events. So uh, the Rufus program, the dog bite prevention right there, um, that is a program that was developed here at the uh, veterinary school. And so they created this dog bite prevention training for children because children are the number one population that gets bitten by dogs. And so it's, it's one year old to five year old boys. I, I think you'll probably all figure out why it's one to five year old boys because they don't know when to stop. And so we do this training in pre-K all the way up to, we kind of do about first, second grade, um, where we're training 
kids how to approach dogs, how to identify, is that dog mad, is that dog angry, is that dog friendly, is that, you know, how to approach a dog safely, <coughs> and when to, and what to do if they have a dog that comes and tries to bite them. So that's something we've done um, in our, we kind of, I, I was uh, allowed to steal it from the, the university here and uh, use throughout the military. But we also have lots of dog runs, uh, lots of public outreach on animal health and animal behavior and just how to take care of your pets during traveling and if you're moving overseas. So we try to get as much information out there to make, to decrease that stress in our military community of having a pet. So we don't want to just tell them, oh, sorry, you can't have a pet, it's too hard to do it. Um, it's definitely not too hard, but we can make it easier. So this is our dog bite prevention that we did last year with my interns. And uh, one of my interns was actually a puppy raiser for Guide Dogs for the Blind, so she just had a puppy that we could use as, a, as an example, and we went to some of the schools and had um, just had a really great time with the kids, and hopefully they learned stuff. It's amazing how fast they pick things up. They were, you know, figuring out all the cues, and oh, what do you do if a dog bites you, and, or tries to bite you? They're like, okay, you stand like this, and it was pretty, it was pretty excited. So this was something fun that we were able to do. So some of the roadblocks that we have, um, infection control, and I'll get, I'll get to, a, I don't know if anybody saw a Fox News uh, uh, report that came out last week, but we'll, we'll talk about that. So there's no health issue, there's no issues with healthy dogs going into, say, a hospital environment and bringing in infectious diseases. As long as the dog is vaccinated, clean, deworm, there's no problems with that. So if, if you want to start on raw food diets, don't give your dog more raw food diets. Um, getting that connection between the Red Cross and the hospitals, getting that communication with the hospital commanders because it's their hospital and they're going to allow whoever they want onto the hospital grounds. So talking with them and letting them know that these programs exist and we can do this. And then a lot of times the veterinary services, um, we're only contacted if something goes bad. And then we find out that, oh, you guys did this without letting us know. <laughs> so um, we tr we're trying to get really proactive about getting into our hospitals and letting them know that we have these services and we can help them uh, develop these programs safely so that they don't run into problems. And then just getting the policies written. Okay, so this one came out. My mom sends me all of these articles. And so therapy dogs can spread superbugs to kids. Um, and this was at Johns Hopkins, and they had like four dogs that go through, and they found that the dogs, the kids that interacted with the dogs more had a higher risk of getting MRSA infection than, the, than those that did not interact with the dogs. Basically, it's just um, hand washing and sanitation between patients. So the MRSA is in the hospital. We know the MRSA is in the hospital. And the dogs, just like people, just like equipment, just like anything else in the hospital, if you're going from room to room, you can spread that MRSA. And so they figured out that, oh, okay, the dogs were getting the MRSA because they had one patient with MRSA. Pets the dog. MRSA's on the dog's fur. Dogs goes to the next hot next the room. The next patient pets the dog, picks up the MRSA. So the dogs are kind of acting like little fomites <laughs> um, to spread MRSA. And so what they found is, well, if you, if you use um, uh, just something as simple as baby wipes to wipe off the dogs in between patients, wipe off their paws, hand sanitizers, having the, having the kids wash their hands after they interact with the dog, that pretty much brings the risk down to zero. So I hate, I hate that they use these headlines to make it sound, oh gosh, the dogs are just full of infection, but it's really not. It just is like, okay, this makes sense. You have to have basic sanitation with the dogs, just like everybody else in the hospital.
not regulatory, but kind of oversight organizations, and they have to get those dogs from them. And this is why, because we don't want people to be injured. We don't want to have um, you know, people be hurt and the dogs have to be euthanized because it wasn't done properly. And so we're really pushing to make these programs very carefully so that we don't have problems like this. All right, and I think this is my last, <clears throat> last one before our working dog stuff. So service animals, these are not pets, they are working animals, they are trained for specific tasks. Our emotional support animals are just people's pets that make them feel better. Service animals are under the ADA, whereas emotional support animals are not. They're covered under the Fair Housing Act and then the Air Carriers Act, but they do not have as much, um, uh, they don't have as much access to facilities as your service animals. Big point, any of these animals, if they're unruly or if they're misbehaved or if they're causing problems, they can be asked to leave regardless of whether it's listed as a service animal or an emotional support animal. A lot of people don't know that. Uh -huh. On any of these dogs, the working under service dogs, is there any sort of genomic typing for behaviors that would indicate before they actually exhibit behavior that maybe this dog has a genetic with service dogs, yes. So that's why you see a lot of service dogs are, uh, not German Shepherds, but a lot of service dogs are Labradors or Golden Retrievers. And so it's kind of a breed trait thing that we're looking at. And you'll see when we talk about the working dogs, you're looking at German Shepherds, Mountain Wolves, and so they have a sp specific set of traits. But as for getting an individual, like this dog will be really good at this, it's a lot of, just over time through the training, determining that individual dog's kind of pers in personality and how quickly they catch on to training cues. Um, that just, we can't really like genetically say that yes, this dog is gonna be really good at this. We can say these breeds are generally better at it, but not like specific dogs. Yeah. So any sort of genome wouldn't give any sort of additional insights down the road in the future? No. Yeah. We're, we're trying, I'll kind of I'll kind of get a little bit. Sure. Okay, so yeah, you can basically get, you can pay $50 to get your service animal vest online. Um, this is not a legitimate way to get a service dog. There's a lot of fraud out there, a lot of people taking your money and saying, here, we'll give you a certificate, it's a service dog. It's not a service dog. <laughs> There's our service Frenchie, and then we have our emotional support animals. So we've got an emotional support pig. I'm sure you guys have seen all of these. An emotional support turkey. I can't imagine looking at that all the time. Turkeys are great. They still smell. They're still turkeys. Um, we get a lot of people who are faking things and just trying to get on board with a free ride for their animal. Um, this is a miniature horse. Didn't fit comfortably in the back, so they gave him a first class ticket, and then he proceeded to poop all over the first class um, section. Uh, an emotional support monkey needed an emotional support bird. So uh, emotional support animals need emotional support animals. And then you have need five emotional support bunny rabbits. It just has gotten so out of control. And this is why we worry about this. So this is a dog team and they were awarded the, uh, the um, service dog of the year award. And then they try to get on a plane and because so many people have been abusing the system, they have issues getting on a plane. And so that's why we need to have more control over these animals going into our environment. And so this is what we don't want to see, and our consequences are now that now the airlines are kind of cracking down on them on their own. So individually, each airline is coming out with their own policies on what they you know, what animals they're allowing and what documentation they need to have on their flights. So it's kind of a long time coming, and since the service dog human bond community didn't regulated itself well enough, now the airlines are doing it. So we'll, we'll have to see where that goes. All right, any questions on that? Oh my gosh, I'm talking too much. Okay, I do wanna get into the working dog stuff. So our working dog program. So how do we get our dogs? We either get them two ways. We go, uh, they send a team of trainers and veterinarians to usually Europe to purchase dogs or we have a puppy program down in San Antonio where we do breed dogs. And this is where we try to do the breeding and trying to get the right traits of these dogs. But genetics are very complicated and it's really hard to get the good traits and not get the bad traits. So we're trying to 
you know, we're trying to breed for temperament, we're trying to breed for trainability, and we're also trying to breed for physical characteristics that are gonna make these dogs usable and long-lasting, so they have a long-lasting career. Um, this is our little Jack Russell down in Norfolk, um, Virginia, and that Jack Russell gets to search the submarines because we can't fit a Malinois or a German Shepherd in a submarine. So he's there doing that. Most of our dogs are German Shepherds or Malinois, though, because they have a higher <coughs> drive, they're very energetic, um, they're big enough to do what we need them to do. Uh, getting a little bit away from the German Shepherds because they have a lot of hip and back issues that we haven't been able to work with. Uh, so we're going more towards Malinois. But the Malinois are a little crazy, and so they're a little harder to train. <laughs> so for our training, we have puppy raisers in the San Antonio area. So with our puppy program, they basically get the puppies and they socialize them, they do basic obedience on them for um, about a year, and then they take them back to Lackland where they start doing their military training. And we train our dogs in dual purpose, so patrol, which is going out and, like my intern here, getting apprehended, um, and that's me up there, I got, I was in a bite suit. Uh, if you ever have a chance to get a bite suit, it's hilarious, it's fun, uh, you only get a little bit of bruise, it's okay. Um, so they're, they're trained in patrol, and then they're also either trained to have explosive detection or narcotics detection. So those are kind of our two dogs. Our two yeah, dogs. If I can ask a question. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, dogs were used because they can sniff things out in parts per billion yep. when they're smelling. There are companies like Vapor Sense that have come up with dental technology that now can are as good as a dog's nose. As the technology emerges as a disruptor, Mm -hmm. for what dogs do, how do you adjust or how do you plan for We have, um, yeah, we were, we were actually just talking about this before because yes, there are technologies out there to detect scents. The problem they're having is that there is something where the machinery can detect the scent, but there's no, there's not enough AI, there's not enough analysis that apparently the dogs are doing to determine whether it's truly a threat or it's not a threat. So they're finding that these detectors are not very useful because they don't have that, that little step in between the dog's brain sure, at to- this, At this point in time, but I mean- that's Oh yeah, in the future, it very well could work. We can mm -hmm. sample the parts for good. Yeah, yeah. It's just a matter of time of the fire. Yeah. By, you know, FBI and ATF, these organizations pump money into it and evolve that to the next level. Yeah. So, then, so the you know, it's just like horses. We used horses. Very good. And then we had, you know, motorized vehicles. So eventually it'll get there. It's not there yet. So again, how does, you you would be chat in the future you would be challenged. So mm -hmm. how do you how do you blend the two? Because I'm sure there isn't one solution to this one. With as as well, like dog can do to sniff out as explosives as compared to tech. The newer tech that's working that can that can sense explosives. Like where where do the dogs fit in? Sorry. Yeah, not where in the future or how do you know? If the tech is good enough, then we we'll you know either reduce or completely eliminate the need for dogs. That's a bummer. So I know it's a, it's a real big bummer, but it's not there yet. And also we're also looking at the dogs for their um, uh, for their hearing capabilities too. So they're sensing out there too, but also they're they're kind of like our dogs. Maybe that's a partial solution, yeah. but there is added value yeah. for the dogs as mm -hmm. compared to um, a detective. Yep. And it's something about having the dog with all, you know, it's, it's oh, entire sensing, yeah. you know, it's they're able to detect uh, people who are far away because they can smell them and hear them. And so I think it's all that sensory information that the dog is, so I don't, is, you know, bringing in and analyzing and saying, oh, that's a threat, we gotta, you know, I gotta alert my yeah, handler. So I think it's like, yeah, that's nice to have one thing that just smells stuff, but I think it's it's kind of more all encompassing when it comes to dogs. Yeah, I'd be sad, because the, dog, the dogs are fantastic. Working with the dogs and the dog handlers are just, it's so much fun. So dog handlers come from all different branches of the military. And usually they are uh, MPs or they're military police first, and then they work up to uh, a good, a high enough level, and they basically have to apply and be accepted into the dog handler program. So um, these are a couple of my dog handlers down in Puerto Rico, and then one of our uh, dog teams down at, at Fort Benning right now. And they all go, everybody goes to Lackland. So the Air Force actually 
owns all of the dogs and the army has a veterinarian. So that's just kind of how it's split up. So if you have a dog that goes through training and just simply didn't make it, usually these dogs are uh, sent out to local, state, and um, community, you know, uh, municipal police departments. So they have a little bit different standards for their dogs. So if they don't make ours, usually they're perfectly fine to go work for a police department or TSA, uh, Customs Border Patrol, those kind of things. But a lot of those dogs that fail out of our program go to them. And if they're just simply not a good dog and they just should be on the couch, then we adopt these dogs out. So sometimes they just go to, uh, to the couch. <laughs> and so medical care, our working dogs get excellent medical care. There's pretty much sky's the limit when it comes to cost and services. We have a lot of specialty recovery facilities. We've got um, uh, board certified surgeons and radiologists and just, I, I mean, the whole gamut. And so one of, this is our uh, physical therapy down in San Antonio. So if we have a dog that needs to do some recovery from an injury, we can send them down there. Um, these, that's a picture of my friend sent me because she was deployed and one of the dogs got uh, shot, and so he had an injured back leg. He's perfectly fine. He's now living on a couch somewhere. Um, Cujo was also injured, and so he has this, it's really hard to see, but he has a really cool, like, orthopedic bone stabilization. I don't do surgery, but it looks really cool. And then we also have a lot of uh, training. So this is a dummy dog that we use that's like a CPR dog. And so you can do CPR and put catheters in and all sorts of stuff. And we do, they are evacuated out. So if there's room on the plane, if there's room on the chopper, we're getting the dog out. So they're treated just like military soldiers um, when it comes to evacuation and medical care. All right, and then adoption. Most of our dogs are adopted out. The current handler gets first dibs of that dog. Now these dogs don't stay with their handler through their entire career. They usually have three or four or five different people that work with them. And so I hate seeing these stories. Oh, they didn't give the dog, the dog handler the dog. Well, because that dog handler wasn't the current handler. So that's just how it does. We give the current handler the first dibs on these dogs. If they can't take them, usually one of the veterinary staff um, gets to adopt them. The retirement ceremony for Inda, she was adopted out to one of my uh, civilian animal technicians. We also have Grisha, he's with us right now. He had a knee surgery, but he's going home with one of our interns. Um, Bosco and Captain Ryder, she was another intern who adopted a working dog. But the general public can go on to the Lackland web, uh, website and they've got an adoption page. So if it just seems like nobody wants to adopt these do this, this dog, which very rarely happens, then they put it out to the, the, the public and so civilians can actually adopt these dogs. Um, there's multiple checks before these dogs are adopted. So they get a training check, a behavior check to make sure that they're safe. They get medical checks to make sure that they are healthy and um, physically able to be uh, retired. We're usually adopting them out at about 10 to 11 years old. So they don't have a whole heck of a lot of years for these size of dogs. And so we don't want them to be in pain. So sometimes if a dog, it's very, very rare that this happens, but if there's a dog that is just way too aggressive and is dangerous, or if the dog is just so physically you know, um, ill, um, if they've got cancer, if they've got debilitating um, arthritis, then we do have to put those dogs to sleep. But that's the vast majority of the dogs. When, in any situation, when you change the handler for the dog, or it goes to a family, how does the dog adapt? Oh, the dogs adapt great. <laughs> they love it. They, they are perfectly happy to go <laughs> sit on a couch. They, they absolutely love being adopted out. Um, they, adjust, they adjust to civilian life very well. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, this is Bino. He was one of my dogs in, in uh, Puerto Rico, and he was adopted by the hospital commander there. And I mean, it's just, they're just fantastic. And the funny thing is, though, sometimes their training will kick in. And so if you see your, you, you have your, your adopted dog, and all of a sudden, if you look at something and they sit, and you're like, why are you sitting? Because that's the cue that they found something. <laughs> So sometimes it can be a little bit unnerving because you're like, why are you sitting? <laughs> what are you looking for? So sometimes the training kind of kicks in, but usually they are, they just become fat and happy on the couch. <laughs> so uh, some, of, some of the myths about our working dogs, we don't leave them overseas. They all come back here. They all get um, 
retired out in the US. Um, some people asked me about titanium teeth. I don't even know where this came from, but they were like, oh, you're putting titanium teeth in the dogs to make them bite harder. No, that's not what we do. Um, they did try, you know, there has been some work with replacement kind of like implant teeth with dogs. The problem is with the titanium, it's too strong. And so the, the jaw's not strong enough. The titanium's stronger than the jaw. So <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna get jaw bone issues uh, if you put those teeth in. So no, that's not a thing. Um, they don't euthanize them all after service. They all go to, to uh, couch land. Um, contract dogs are another issue. We, had, we you know, there's a lot of, of stories in the press about all these contract dogs overseas being left and euthanized. That's unfortunate, we don't own those dogs. The Army doesn't own those dogs. Um, when the wars were ramping up in Af Afghanistan and Iraq, we couldn't supply dogs fast enough. We didn't have enough dogs for what we needed, and so we did have a lot of contracts out with civilian organizations. Um, and some of those didn't go very well, as you guys probably have seen. But they're not our working dogs, um, and hopefully now they've figured out how to, if they're gonna use contracting dogs, I've read reports, this hadn't always been the case, has it been? I read reports at the end of World War II that uh, service dogs basically were were put down, all yes. the ones in the South Pacific and the yeah. ones in the European. So that actually um, went through, the, the working dog system of today is definitely not what it, what it happened, even through the Vietnam War. In the Vietnam War, they left all the dogs. And that became such a huge problem, not only for you know public perception, but the soldiers, the dog handlers, there. If you want to, if you want to cry for an hour, there's a very good um, documentary on service dogs, especially talking to Vietnam vets who worked with the service dogs and had to leave their dogs over there. And so, from that, there's been changes to the system. Uh, Robbie's Law is, uh, oh, I want to say that was not, uh, early '90s when it came out, and that basically established the adoption program. And so, uh, also in like World War One and World War, World War Two, there wasn't a standing working dog program. They were pretty much, hey, donate your dog to the war effort kind of thing. So that's why you see all these random different breeds back, you know, in those wars because it wasn't an established program. They're just like, all right, we just need a whole bunch of dogs. Let's train them up really fast and just push them out. Now it's a much more structured program that that. Uh, we can control the dog quality and also what happens to these dogs afterwards. Because in World War II, they sent the dogs home. Like, okay, you're, you know, Miss Jones' dog. We're gonna send you back and go be Miss Jones' dog again. So there was like a gap, and then they figured out, hey, maybe we should actually keep this going so we have some good dogs. But yeah, big changes. It's and also dogs were not treated medically. Like uh, they were refused uh, service on medevac flights. Now, if there's space, they gotta let them on. So it's it's much much better than it used to be. How many working dogs does Army have? The working dog has about 350 to 400 at any one time, mm -hmm. all around the world. <laughs> we're we're pretty much everywhere, and that's not even counting like special forces dogs. Sometimes we don't know how many dogs they have, um, and we don't quite know what they're doing, but uh, we, we take care of them too. Here's, here's um, if anybody wants information, this is a ridiculously long web address. If you just Google military working dog Blackland Air Force Base, on their main page, there's a, a little banner that says adoptions. And so they'll have the dogs. Usually there's only one or two dogs on there at any time um, for adoption, but if you're interested in that. The Blackland Air Force Base is where they do all of the training and the breeding and everything. Okay. What kind of units do the dogs what they have, so they're mostly for military police. Um, we also have dogs in special forces. We have dogs in civil affairs units. Um, they're all throughout, so, so Army, Navy, Marines. Um, there's uh, some customs and border patrol dogs and like Coast Guard dogs too. Uh, MPs let's see. Are, MPs yes, oh yeah, the military police, that's most, most of our dogs are with military police. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then we have some dogs that were special search dogs that we were using for a while. Uh, and I think those are the big, the big ones that use them. Yeah. So that is, that is my talk. If anybody has any more questions. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm like, I don't know, I'm running out of time. I have two questions. <laughs> is DNA 
testing done on any of the dogs to look at their temperament? You were talking yes. about that. And that's what they've been doing with the puppy program. And there's like, I haven't taken genetics in forever, but they have like a gigantic, what's a square? The, oh, the square. Yes, there you go. And it's got like 30 traits on each side and this thing is just immense. And so they are definitely looking into, especially now that they have the puppy dog program with, with specific traits. Um, so yes. And then my second question, if I could, is do you have, what do you use for a control group? You were talking about studies being done. Over study? Is mm -hmm. there a specific, I guess in the process, without getting too detailed, control, what, what you use as a control uh -huh. factors? Sure. For so basically study? it will be, so say we're in a hospital working with children, we'll say, all right, these children who are going through similar conditions, similar procedures, will get the dog, and these kids won't. Another way we do it is we have the, uh, the patients be their own control, and so at the Children's Hospital, Habit is working on a program right there where one week the child will get a 10 minute visit with the dog before a sedation procedure, and then the next week they'll get 10 minutes with an iPad before the sedation procedure. And so we'll compare the values in that one patient. So those are kind of two ways that, yeah. We have time for one more question. So the soldiers that are released from the hospital mm -hmm. that still have mental problems that are held by a dog, do they go home with the dog? Yes, that's the psychiatric service dog that we can we can use. And um, are they any breeds of dog? Most of the time they're Labradors or, or, or um, uh, golden, golden Retrievers. Those are kind of your standard labs, Golden Retrievers. service dogs, sometimes they can be different breeds because they're not, uh, they don't have as high demand on them for tasks that they what need to perform. What training do you go um, identifying dog? anxiety, oh, what do you mean? Oh, yeah, if you're the dog. dog. Oh, if you're the dog? Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it ranges, so say identifying a uh, panic attack, so if somebody's gonna have an anxiety attack, training that dog to recognize the signs of an anxiety attack, so you know, so if you're shaking, you know, that you know, the dog knew. Okay. So with, the, with anxiety attacks, a lot of times the dog will just notice it and turn around and either, you know, put their head on the owner's lap or put them on their shoulder. Or sometimes the dog, if you're standing, the dog will come around and kind of walk in between you and kind of make this barrier between you and whatever's stressing you out. And so the dog will kind of come around and just having that, you know, I'm in front of you, I'm protecting you, it's okay. So it's very simple, subtle action. 